Peace and greetings. Presenting the Network of Awareness Podcast Radio Station. Providing in-depth information on society and culture in America and abroad. Bringing you truth messages of inspiration, keen insight, reputable interviews, and so much more. So now, for the truth you've been waiting for, your host of the Network of Awareness Podcast. Aura! Aura! The Informationalist. 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 All right, peace and greetings, people. This is uh, Or the Informationalist, and this is uh, part three to the Narcissism series. Now, previously, uh, we have Brother Oxa Cobb. We started out with Billy Izzy. Uh, Billy Izzy's actually going to be coming back to, uh, to do another part of the Narcissism series. But as I said, I'm going to have multiple guests throughout the year um, for this series. So today I have a great guest who actually has a lot of experience dealing with narcissistic people and recognizing a lot of the idiosyncrasies within a narcissistic uh, behavior within a within an individual uh, and different types of relationships that this individual has endured and has come out on the other side, which as you've heard me say, not many people have, and I definitely didn't just want to get a male perspective of what is a narcissist, but I wanted to get a female perspective. So I got this uh, lady that um, is from the Caribbean. Her name is Zada. And um, Zada and I have discussed doing this show because she felt like she had a lot of input to, to bring to this particular subject. So I want to welcome to the Network of Awareness, Zada. How you doing, Zada? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. All right. You're very welcome. And um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I think you're going to add great value for the listeners to for us to continue to educate about this thing called narcissism, which is really like, in my opinion, I think it's an epidemic here in the United States. Um, I'm pretty sure you've seen it, you know, in the Caribbean, um, you know, just around the world. I'm pretty sure it's an issue. But here in the United States, I feel like it's the breeding ground uh, for narcissistic behavior to really flourish and thrive, especially when it comes to business. But it's becoming a big problem within women. Women are becoming very narcissistic these days and those numbers are growing. But you as a woman um, have experienced this with men. So I want to tackle that, but this is a question that I ask every guest in regards to this topic before we even start talking about it. What does narcissism mean to you? Oh, to me, right, because everyone has their sort of definition and what they've experienced um, in their own personal lives to what narcissism is. For me, narcissism is somebody that has absolutely no regards to others' needs, their agendas. They are going after their goals and their agendas. So others' needs is not important to them at all. They will. They are very manipulative people, and they will manipulate anybody they need to to get to their goal, to get to their agenda. And um, someone who's completely indulged in their ego. I mean, people that they see they have absolute, they have little to no flaws. They're damn near perfect. And that's a narcissist to me. Okay, great. Great answer. And uh, it's always good to hear everybody's perspective on narcissism, especially those that have experienced it. And you have, you know, based on my discussions with you, you have experienced it in relationships with men. And, um, and I'm pretty sure you've experienced it at work um, and things that you've done. And um, I just want to first start off by saying, 
when did you first realize that you were dealing with a narcissist? And so when I first realized it, I was pretty young. I was um, just getting out of high school. I was in high school at the time. So it was my senior year and it was my very first serious relationship. And, um, you know, things happened with this boy. And, you know, I was just always thinking like, it's because we're young. It's because we're young. And this is why it's going on. He doesn't really realize what he's doing. He's, you know, we're in high school. We, I was giving chance after chance and you kind of realize it. It took me a couple of months, but they will apologize for their mistakes. And, and you kind of have to realize in time, they will continue to do those same mistakes. Yes, they're young, but there's little to no control. They're impulsive. And I kind of just realized like, okay, these same mistakes keep happening. And I keep hearing things um, from others that whatever I'm thinking that this per- that my ex was doing, it was just things that's going on in my head. I'm just kind of like making up, making it up in my head. Like I'm crazy, like, you know, and that's why you would keep giving this person chances because it's like they put you in a cycle. Like, okay, you're just crazy. You're just thinking things up in your head. You're not actually, this is actually not happening, but it is. And you were being gaslighted a lot. Gaslighted a lot. I will be confronted. I'll confront my ex with these issues. Like, Hey, I thought you said you wasn't going to do this anymore. Like what's going on? Like, and then again, they'll apologize for that same mistake. And but then in, in the background, they're kind of saying, OK, my ex is she's going crazy. Like she's saying I'm doing this and that. But you apologize for this that you're doing. So how could I be crazy if you're apologizing for that? You know, that's when I realized, OK, I'm in a loop at this point. I'm in a loop and I want to get out of the loop. And it took me a couple months. But, you know, for some people, it takes years. So and I was really young. So I, I do give myself some some slack for that. And that kind of just from that experience being so young, that happening to me, that set the bar for me for future relationships. So you said that you was very young when you experienced this. Um, Being very young can work against you because you're somewhat impressionable and naive to the world because you haven't had enough experience. So I'm curious to know that. What was it that helped you to get out so quickly at such a young age? Because you would think that at a young age, you're not mature enough to understand certain things the way you would if you had the experience to back it. So with your lack of experience at being you know, a teenager, what was the defining factor that helped you to get this person out of your life for once and for all? So that was happening in the background. Um Something happened in my family. My brother, he's no longer with us, but he, we would give him round the clock care. And my ex knew this. So with my brother, he was in an accident and he suffered a severe brain injury. We would give him round the clock care for three years. And my ex knew this and he saw the gravity of it. He would come over and see it. But You got to understand with a narcissist, no matter what you're going through in your personal life, they have they they don't have capacity to empathize. They it's little to no empathy. So I would see that that was happening. Like he would go behind my back and start doing all these all these just immature, just continuously do these mistakes over and over. But, you know, what was going on in my personal life with my brother? And then after my brother passed away, he was still, you know, he was kind of there for me. He was trying to be there for me and trying to show a little bit of empathy, the little tiny bit of empathy that he had. And then continuously try and get me into that that loop again. And I was like, okay, so you see what was going on in my personal life. And then after my brother passed, you still wanted to do the same things. And that was like, okay. 
at this point, you're definitely not going to change no matter what. This person is definitely not going to change. And something as heavy as death in a family member, you would think like, okay, like this person's going to be fully there for me. He's, he's supposed to be my significant other. He's supposed to be much more empathizing and not run off, be there for a little while and then run off and do the same things over and keep me in that loop. And I just didn't want to be that in that loop and be a victim anymore. So I got out. I definitely got out of that for sure. It had to, that had to happen as well, you know, with my, with my family member, like the, the death aspect and the grief of that, I was already grieving over that death. And then I had to continuously be hurt with what was going on with my significant other. I chose to put all my energy and healing into the grieving of my brother instead of having to grieve over this person that's never going to change. You just continuously have to heal and grieve and then pull me back in into a loop. I I was done at that point. What was the defining factor though in that process? Like what was the, the final straw that broke the camel's back? Can you remember that? I would say putting me in that loop again. It was just, I guess, in my heart, I was already over it, but it was just that one more chance. And like I said, after my brother passed away, he was like definitely saying that he was going to for sure change and, and all that. And he saw how hard I was and he wanted to be in my life. That was all just talk. And, you know, he used, we were very intimate and he, and he liked to use that power over me. The fact that he was the one that um, I was met like the for the first time ever was yeah. with him, and he knew he had that power over me, and that I was going to just stick beside him because, well, I have her wrapped around my finger, and then the very last time we were intimate, and then he kind of ghosted me, and then I was like, okay, that it was just all talk, and then I was done. And then after a couple months later, he kind of tried to come back. And I was like, you done, you done messed up. You really done messed up this time because I was done. It's interesting you say that because even like if the person's not a narcissist, I remember growing up and um, guys taking girls virginity, so to speak, and be using that to their advantage in the relationship. Um, I remember that like it was yesterday and um, it even if they weren't narcissistic, it was still a, a manipulation play behind it because they knew that that person was really into them because they shared something very special, which is, you know, having sex for the first time. And obviously sex being a spiritual thing, the woman is going to gravitate to that energy and take it very seriously because it's something that they're doing for the first time. So they hold it very near and dear. And they think that that guy is the one because they're the ones that, that they decided to do that with. So it doesn't surprise me that that happened. Um, by the way, uh, people for the people listening, I forgot to mention this. The title of this particular episode is going to be called detoxing from the toxic. And the reason it's titled that is because what, uh, Zada and I are going to talk about is really what narcissism is, but we're going to really talk about how to detox from this toxicity, which is in um, it's another analogy for basically saying how to properly heal from a narcissistic relationship. And this is any type of narcissism, how to properly heal. So with that being said, let's talk about the toxicity that a narcissist brings, right? We talked about the gaslighting a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more in depth with that because it seems like that's one of the biggest things or behaviors that a narcissist exhibits when in a relationship is the gaslighting, is the constant mm -hmm. putting down, the making you feel like you're going crazy because you're seeing things that are not adding up. And you're questioning them on it. 
You're like, hey, you know, in my relationship that I that I got out of, I, I was seeing a lot of suspect behavior from changing phone numbers to not picking up phone calls for hours on end. And then all of a sudden acting like nothing happened, like they like I wasn't just calling or trying to reach out to them throughout the day or changing social media accounts, changing profiles, um, ending certain friendships or relationships that they had going on out of nowhere. And um, all these different behavioral patterns that I was seeing change up in a moment's notice made me start to question these things. And what happens is when you start to question a narcissist, they take it as disrespect because they look at you like you shouldn't be questioning shit that they're doing. Everything they do is good. And they want you to truly believe that. And what's unfortunate about that is that a lot of narcissists will cheat on you. You know, and um, because they have no empathy, it's all about just uh, and I talked about this with Oxycontin, it's about getting that supply of energy wherever they can. It doesn't matter who they're getting it from. So with that being said. What are some of the tox toxic behavioral patterns that you've seen within narcissists in your experiences dealing with narcissists? So. Like you said, um, it's one of those like whatever you say, instead of sitting down with your significant other, clearly communicating, OK, um, why are you insecure about this? What could we do to fix it? Instead, they'll com completely blow it out of proportion, make you think you're crazy and twist words that you said and say in a different way just to piss you off even more and get you irate. And then say, well, you're acting crazy. You're acting, why are you acting out? But not realizing, actually, they do realize that they're doing it because they like to see the reaction that they get out of you too. They're like, okay, how, mu how much more can I, can I hyper up? I like to, that's the supply that they're getting. That's what they, that's what they're trying to get out of you. And um, yeah, just like you said, and ping, like in work, uh, pinning others against each other. I think it was you or uh, you or Billy that mentioned that in the part one. They pin others against each other at work. Yeah, it's called triangulation. Yeah, yeah. and um, that was the main main thing that I that I noticed is the twisting of the words, always. So that they 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 want to look like they're absolutely no wrong. And it's extremely manipulative. What do you think in regards to the society that we live in here? Because you're now you're now in the States, right? Even though you're from the Caribbean, you're not in the Caribbean right now, but that's where you're from. Um, I know you've come to the States now and it's a whole different culture out here from from where you're originally from. Um, when it comes to American society, as far as the United Shenanigans of America. What are some of the things that you've seen in culture that you feel like it's very supportive to to it's 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 condoning and 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 kind of cultivating nar the narcissist their behavior? We see going on on social media. Like social media is a huge plays a huge part of it. Um, just it's so ego centered on social media and that's uh in the american society it's how much clout can i get um who, who do i have to know and um it's all about agendas and that's what's going on a lot in america um people are trying to get to the top to the top and it's always you know it's always been like that but now more than ever it's very heavily centered on clout and very, it's very, how can I say? I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> well, just while you're having that brain fart, I thought it's interesting that you don't have social media accounts. I think that's a really good thing because I was like that for a while. I didn't have any social media. I didn't get into social media until I was 41 years old. Now, I had a Facebook account for years, but it was a Facebook account that I only use to contact family that I couldn't get a hold of otherwise, especially some of my cousins. 
It's like, I can't get a hold of my cousin via text, but I can get a hold of my cousin via Facebook, which was insane. But uh, that's the culture that I didn't really, I wasn't privy to because I kind of stood away from it. But I didn't get into uh, social media until I started my network. And once I started my network is when I really started engaging in social media because I wanted to build my business and build notoriety through my business with social media and let people know what it is that I do and give them an opportunity to get to know it so that I can grow and market myself. That's what I use social media for, to market the network of awareness. But I think you, you, it's a good thing that you don't have social media because it's just a big distraction if it's not serving a very definitive purpose for growth. If it's just there to serve the ego, I think it's very unhealthy. It can be unhealthy, especially when you go on Instagram or whatever social media platform and you're just scrolling and scrolling. It's also distractions on social media. And it's a lot of comparing one against the other on social media, too. That's a huge thing, like just a lot of comparing and ego centered people love to compare others to them and always constantly trying to compete. What do you think about the morality when it comes to, to women these days? Do you think that there is any type of moral compass um, that women have in today's society? Because I ask, because I feel like a lot of women don't have morality anymore, as well as men. Now, I'm not focusing on women, but I want to get the woman's perspective on that. What do you think about the morality of women these days, where it's almost like I feel like a lot of women don't have integrity. They, they don't have any high self-esteem of themselves. And they're very, very superficial and artificial in the way they want to look, especially to their image. Because the fake ass thing where they're taking fat from the stomach and putting it into the ass, it's like, it's, it's almost like especially in certain places around the United States, it's really huge where that's a big thing. You got a lot of women that are getting breast implants. You got a lot of women that are getting, um, what is that called? Uh, Botox. The Botox thing is like, I think, and, and, and I think the Kardashians, you know, I think the Kardashians really kind of set the tone for this superficial behavior. Because they became so popular in this behavior that they became the, the standard, right? Like they became the textbook standard for like, hey, if you want to be sexy and hot and get a lot of attention, this is the blueprint for you. And as some people may or may not know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but that's what witches COVID. They, they witches. They practice a lot of dark black magic. And they suck a lot of energy from black men. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's their thing. Um, and not even just black men, white men, oh, yeah. whatever, Hispanic men, whatever, whatever social construct you want to put out there. They're sucking energy from men. Okay. Um, so my question to you is, why do you think that there's such a big hype around this superficial, artificial behavior to want to focus on image so much when it comes to the flesh? It really is the culture of today. Like, like we were talking about social media. It really is a, like you said, it's good to have for business person purpose, the blessing, but it also, it's also a curse. It has a lot to do with also the music nowadays. And like you said, um, certain celebrities have influenced young people's mindset as well. So when they see all of this, their goal is not to, you know, um, be on a righteous path or um, be goal driven or, you know, have a, a go getter mindset. Well, I wouldn't say that either. It's more so like their goals are. Um, redirected into this centered kind of, you know what I mean? Like the looks, the superficial, and there is morality in women, but it's rare nowadays. Same thing with men. Morality is rare, but, but it's, 
it's hard to find. It's like needle in a haystack, 20 haystacks kind of thing nowadays, especially in America. Um, it's very, it's very superficial. It's very superficial. And I'd say like, we're, we are fighting that spiritual warfare right now in today's time. It's even more with that as well. Like people that have gotten the jab and that's how I also seen such a quick reset and shift during these past two, three years is when all this went down with the jab as well. It, it's also spiritual. So you got social media that's heavily uh, self-centered, ego-centered, very superficial. And then we're battling whatever we're battling on the spiritual side with the jab and it's, it has aspects to it, but in, t- in today's time, it's with the morale integrity. It, I mean, you would really have to take your time and isolate and do inner work and be with yourself to find, or for the most high to lead you to the person that you're supposed to be with. You really mm-hmm. have to take your time because it, it's, it's rare. It's really rare. Now, speaking of that, I'm glad you brought that up because that leads to my next question is one thing for me that I'm heavily focused on these days is not to become jaded. I don't want to become a jaded person. And I have been in the past before I even, you know, from relationships that had nothing to do with narcissism. And now that I've experienced it, um, I'm like, damn, now, you know, because of my age, I'm like, I'm not going to get jaded. Like that's, that's not happening. I've worked too hard in my life to come to this point, to allow myself to get that emotion or to feel that way. Cause it's, it's like taking three steps back from me and I refuse to become that person. But with all that being said, when it comes to dealing with narcissists and the things that you've experienced, things that I've experienced, what are some of the things that you can kind of be aware of when getting to know somebody, like some of the telltale signs that you might possibly be dealing with a narcissist or be dealing with a narcissist. So that way for the people that are listening, if they are, if they're like in a process of dating someone or getting to know someone or even in a relationship, a long-term relationship as we speak, but what are the telltale signs from the jump for male or female, that if they're getting to know somebody from the very first day, what are some tips and advice that you can give the listeners to let them know, hey, here are some things to be aware of when dealing with whoever you're dealing with. And if they're showing these types of signs or symptoms, then it's probably most likely that you're dealing with a narcissist. So I would say for... For me personally, a telltale sign that would have me running for the hills is if from day one or day two, they are already telling you their whole life story. I'm not saying, you know, like, not just like tidbits, they're exposing their whole life, their experiences from the past and their childhood and everything from the get go. That's red flags right there because they're trying to reel you in trying to gain your trust as quickly as possible. They're, they like to move quick. They can only put up a persona for so long and a facade for so long before their true self is dying to come out. So they're going to try and expose everything so that you can start telling your stories and your past. So you kind of start getting a connection with them because you're you feel like you're getting you're getting real deep with this person that, oh my mm. gosh, they're exposing <laughs> themselves so quick. They're exposing everything that they've been through so quick. They trust me. They already trust me fast. Like, wow, that since they're already telling me their stories, I might as well tell my stories, you know, because, you know, that trust is being built. A little too quick, though. A little too quick. It's like, what? you don't know me, though. Why are you telling me all this and you don't know me? That's it's, oh, yeah. It's so interesting you brought that up because I think that's when it, that's where I failed that because because I am uh, an influencer and I have my podcast and my show. There's you know the relationship I got into the person that I got in a the relationship they were listening to my show 
every day. So they knew a lot about me based on my show, because on my show, I'm somewhat transparent about my life experiences to help others in their life experiences. And it's something that I'm perfectly comfortable with for two reasons, because it's serving a greater purpose outside of myself and because I really don't give a shit about what people think about me. You know what I mean? I, I've, I've been like that for a long time. And that's one of the most liberating, fulfilling things that I've ever come to an understanding is not caring about what other people think about me. And my biggest thing is if I'm not doing something to hurt you, then I shouldn't give a shit about what you think about me. I don't care who you are. I don't even care if you're my own mother. I don't even care what my mother thinks about me, you know, at this point in my life or my my father, my brothers, my si- whoever it is, even my own child. It's like, if I'm not doing nothing to hurt you, I can give two shits. And it's just interesting that you say that because I feel like because I'm so transparent, when I got into this narcissistic relationship, it moved very fast in that manner that you just described because I already had a life story that was shared. So the person had a lot of tidbits about me that they can yeah. reference. So they felt like, hey, let me tell you everything about me. And then I felt like, oh, wow, you know, like, well, let me tell you more. And then I got caught up in that cycle. And it's just interesting how you broke it down because that's ex- that's exactly what happened to me. And I didn't even realize. I thought I was doing a good thing, but yet it was a bad thing. And it goes back to what I've been saying. Um, and I know you heard that show with Billy Izzy is that setting boundaries, got to set healthy boundaries. You can't put all the cards on the table. You got to first see if the person's even worth playing with. If the person's even worth being at the table. And I think that's where I messed up. And or should I say not think I know I messed up there. And that's I think that's another thing with the narcissist. They can't accept responsibility for their wrongs. I don't yeah. I, listen. I, if I'm wrong, I love to express how wrong I am when I am because I know it's just going to help me grow. Instead of acting like I didn't do nothing wrong or it wasn't that bad, and I think that's helped me out a lot. But with the narcissist, they can't do that. It's too much of a responsibility that they don't account. And I talked about this with Aksakai. I talked about this with Billy, and I'm talk about it with you. Accountability. What does like for you as a female, do you do you hold accountability in high regard? Yes, completely. And especially because I know in today's society, I know how I know how women could be. For us, it's harder to take accountability. We 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 just naturally Thank you for are saying like, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that, because most women wouldn't wanna, say that. Yes. And for the most part, when you're in a relationship, the man is going to just agree and be like, yeah, babe, you know what? You're right, because they don't really want to fight like that. You know, for us women, it's a little hard to take accountability. Uh, But for me, now that I've just experienced so much and that I've done so much inner work, I think accountability is emotionally mature as well. You're emotionally maturing when you're taking accountability. Because that means you're able to criticize your own issues. You can go inside yourself. You can say, damn, I need to work on this. Why did I do this? I'm going to try my best not to do this mistake ever again. That's accountability. And in the future, saves hurt, not just for yourself, but for the person that you're going to be with. Well said. Well said. Um. What do you think is, what do you think is like the, another telltale sign? Because let's, let's talk about some of these telltale signs. You mentioned one, but do you have another one? Something to be aware of when getting to know someone, if they exhibit a particular behavior that is um, a sign that you're dealing with a narcissist. So they are very quick to criticize or judge something that they they know that they wouldn't do or they don't even think about doing or that they haven't done, they're quick to judge it and criticize, oh no, you should do it this way. No, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but if it comes to them, whatever reckless or impulsive decision 
or act that they're thinking to do or just anything that they do, there's you can't criticize or give constructive criticism because they're not going to listen. They're not going to hear you. They're going to take it as disrespect, disrespect, like completely. But whatever you do, if it's not up to their par, they're going to judge the hell out of you and they're going to heavily criticize you and make you feel like you, why are you doing this? That's not normal. Like going to just completely twist anything that they're not agreeing with. But when it comes to them, even if you know it's something that they contradicted themselves in doing, like they know it's, I know it's wrong. They know it's wrong, but they're deciding to be impulsive about it. You can't criticize them about it or give constructive criticism because it's something that they've cut. They've, their goal is to do that, whatever it is. And they don't care until after the fact. Do you have an example that you can give in regards to that? Yeah. So this guy, I only talked to him for a short period of time. He was heavily spiritual and that also drawed me in. And, um, you know, we built a small, a small connection fairly quickly. And, um, we would talk about the spiritual, spiritual Bible and all that. And he was a heavy drinker. He would drink a, about half a bottle or a bottle every day of liquor. You know, it's mm. like, hey, I'm, I don't really know you like that. I, you know, you've told me your past and everything. So I'm not going to judge you and start saying, you know, start giving him advice, you know, out of nowhere, like you need to stop drinking. Like, I don't, I don't know this person enough. It's only, it's only been like less than two weeks. I'm not going to start, you know, trying to, or give you criticism or so that the person could take it the wrong way. Like, okay, this person is a heavy, heavy drinker. And he would tell me about, like, he wanted to get another face tattoo, even though he would tell me, like, in uh, other days, he would tell me, you know, you're not supposed to put ink on your skin or it taints your skin or, you know, in the Bible where it says that you're not supposed to tat get tattoos and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. But then yeah. An and the next day or, or a few days after, he was like, I'm thinking of getting another face tattoo. It's like, okay. Um, you just completely contradicted what you say a few days ago. I don't judge people that get tattoos. You know, if you want to get a tattoo, go for it. But he was pretty contradictory. But when it came to me, we had a conversation. It was kind of like an intimate conversation. And um, say, oh, well, you can't do that. You know, that, that, that goes against the Bible. You can't do that. So it's like. But you're drinking a you're drinking a, a fifth of scotch or whatever yeah. every other day. And you see, yeah. you know, when you said that to me, I'm like, forget about the narcissism in that situation. Just the drinking alone is a red flag. Right. That's just like, uh, do I want to be with somebody that's drinking every day? Absolutely not. Because that's a that's a mind altering state. And that's pretty much an alcoholic, right? Somebody that's doing that every day, that's, that's a full-blown alcohol, a functioning alcoholic at that. I just find it interesting that a lot of men, it's not the first time I heard this, but a lot of men like to drink and then get, go read scriptures. <laughs> it's like, all right. It's, it's very, I mean, he was so, he felt like he was so spiritual and he was somebody that had came out the camps. So he was ready to give, you know, spiritual advice and I was open for it, but I can't be open to somebody that completely contradicts himself every single day. And you claim to be a heavily a Hebrew and this and all that, but you're completely contradicting everything that you're putting out. You're a walking hypocrite. Yeah. I used to follow a platform like that, <laughs> but, um, so thank you for that example. Um, makes so much sense. What's another telltale sign or something for the people listening to be aware of to, to let them know that they might be dealing with a narcissist? Let's say, because I've had many experiences at work as well. And hey, it's... Yeah, if you want to share that as well, that's fine. It's somebody that... Like I said, for me, uh, uh, the number one for me is somebody that's trying to tell me their story 
very quickly without even knowing me. Like, you know, that's that's a heavy red flag for me. But then you also have to see, okay, how do they act with others? Mm. How do they interact with them? How do the gossiping and going behind somebody's back, you know, being two-faced. That's another heavy telltale sign is being two-faced. You're being very, you know, kind of giving friend vibes and best friend vibes and laughing and smiling and asking about the person's family, asking about their pets and asking about their kids, asking all these questions. But then when they turn around and they walk away, oh, I can't stand this person. Oh my God, I can't wait till this person is out of here. I can't wait till I can't, I don't have to see them anymore. But it's like, why are you asking about their family and friends and stuff if you just can't stand them? They, they like to have that chaos. If there's something always, this is just always chaos around them. Every day there's always stress. They're always in a negative environment. And they're always like, well, I want to get out, out of this negative environment. I can't, I just don't want to be stressed anymore. But you see them actively participating in that negative environment. They're making it negative. And they they constant they're constantly doing it. So as soon as you said that, the first thing that came to mind was Donald Trump. Because I feel like, and I was having this conversation with my brother yesterday. I went out to eat with my brother and um, I was just letting him know. I'm like, why? He don't understand how so many people love this man. And I'm like, because we live in a narcissistic society here in America and he is the, he's narcissism on steroids. He's like, he won his election. You know, he won his election because he was selected, but on the, on the outside looking in, he won his election through gaslighting all his opponents, whether it was male or female gaslighting on a level that we've never seen before in politics. And people were gravitating that, especially so-called white people. They were loving this man like I've never seen before in my life. I mean, where I live, there's people that still got, you know, Trump 2020 on their car. They still got pictures of him. They still got his uh, Trump pen signs on their on their window uh, sills. I mean, it's insane. But People gravitate to that type of behavior and it's pretty pathetic. And somebody like him has gained so much respect and support because of being a narcissist. So I find it interesting that you say that because it's such a, I I can't stress enough how it's such a big problem these days. And People that are listening to the show, some of the things that Zada had uh, touched on, and I think she did a great job, was be careful for somebody trying to move too fast. Be careful with people trying to tell you their story too fast. Be careful with people that really don't show a lot of empathy when it requires for a lot of empathy. And be careful of people that don't exhibit a high level of accountability for their actions. Is there anything else that you can uh, describe in regards for the people listening to look out for? Uh, Somebody that at first you won't realize the gaslighting, but somebody that is quick to twist your word, Mm. very quick Mm. to Mm. twist your words because they want you to see that they are not flawed at all. The narcissist is not flawed. Little to no flaws. Everything they say, you have to listen to them because if not, then you're going completely against them. You're disrespecting them. So somebody that cannot accept constructive critic- criticism is a huge red flag. When you're genuinely, you're not criticizing them because it's fun for you but because you're genuinely trying to help that person, they completely twist it around. And at that point, just that one time, it'll just go. It's like a slippery slope from there. Now Mm. that they see that you completely went against what they're doing and you're trying to, even if it's constructive, you're criticizing them. That's it. You've, you've completely disrespected them. They, they're, they go, they get vengeful. 
almost. They get vengeful. And then they want to get you in that loop, bring you right back. And they want to, I, I remember you said it in the part one, they like to enchant, get you in that enchantment again. Like, you know what? You're right. I should have listened to you. Da, 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 da. And you try and help them again. And it's just, it's a cycle. Just red flag. They can't accept cons- constructive criticism, even if it's winning from the heart. But they'll be ready to give it to you in the most harshest way possible. Maybe real quick and ready. <laughs> yeah, you, you, as you're saying this, I can remember that the first time I experienced it in uh, the relationship I was in was like about eight months ago, man. And it turned into a big shit show quick to the point where I was just like, what the hell just happened? And the person was very irate, hung up on me. And I'm like, what the hell did I do? And, and I remember I was being honest with them about a situation that I experienced and they completely flipped it around on me. Like if I was doing something wrong, I was like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? But that's, that's what they're really good at doing. They're really good at manipulating you to believe that what you're doing and what you're providing and what you're contributing is not good enough. Oh, nothing will add. Mm-hmm. And I would say as well, you start realizing you're in a loop when you realize that nothing will ever be good enough. Nothing will ever be good enough. No matter what you do, no matter if you get out of your, your own identity and you conform to their, to what they want you to be, it still will never be good enough ever. How did that make you feel when you were dealing with that situation of feeling like whatever you do is not good enough? First, um, you know, it does hurt. Obviously that it's, it's really painful because you're just, you're literally hanging on to the thread of, that good side that you see of them mm, and you want to yes. hang on to that. You really want to hang on to cause it, but really it's, it's a f- whole facade. And, yes. but w- in my personal situation, I was already dealing with uh, what I was going through with my brother. So I kind of just put all my energy into that and kind of got out of that real quick. It, it hurt. It was a lot of hurt going on, yeah. but, um, I quickly realized like for this person, I actually kind of felt bad for him too, because nobody is ever going to be good enough for you. No matter what they do, no matter how they conform to whatever you want them to be in your head, you're going to be alone for the rest of your life because nothing is going to be ever good enough. Or you might not even be alone. You might actually get somebody to be with you. That's naive enough. And, you know, and, Enough and really, there are people, unfortunately, that stay for years and years, and it, it does happen. And they're genuinely good people that are trying to fix these people, and they see that enchanting side. They see that, oh, but I know they could be good. And you just you you got to realize at one point, even if it takes months or even if it takes years, you will never be good enough. So. Before that being said, what did you gain from this top that like in your detoxing, right? Which is another cold word for healing, detoxing from the toxic. What have you gained from this? Because I, I, you know, I feel like I've gained so much wisdom and understanding of myself and understanding of how important it is to use discernment as well as setting boundaries for me personally, that's one of the biggest things I've gained is being better at utilizing discernment and being better at setting healthy boundaries. So what was it specifically that you gained that you feel like at this point in your life, it's just priceless. The understanding that you gained from dealing with this, with these toxic narcissistic people. Say, like you said, it's, it's uh, an immense amount of wisdom. Also, it when you get out of it, when you're able to get out of it and you're healing and it's it's like a roller coaster ride. You're not just going to heal 
and be it'll be rainbows and unicorns and you're all healed, you're 100 percent. No, it's 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 a roller coaster ride. Right. But when you're out of lump and out of that, you know, space, you can say, damn, I survived that. Like I'm strong mentally. Some people get bitter. Some people get better. And when you get better, you're on another level of emotionally more like you've been through something traumatizing mentally, but you got out of it and it gives you a whole nother level of like, like you said, discernment. I mean, a discernment that it, it's spiritual. You can't even describe it. The kind of discernment that you get for people after going through that. And it also gives you kind of like a no, no bullshit vibe. Like people can see you and they'll say, damn, I can't, I can't bullshit this person. They'll see right through me kind of thing. It gives you that. It gives you confidence that you can get out. When you get out of this, you can survive anything mentally. You can. I keep hearing that, man. I heard this lady say on YouTube, boy, she it, it brought chills to my spine. It gave me goosebumps where she said, a person that survives narcissistic behavior in a relationship is like somebody who goes to the pits of hell and 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 goes head on with Satan and and survives it and survives right. the experience to tell about it. And they talked about it. And I've heard several psychologists talk, say that you can actually notice another narcissistic survivor. Like within seconds of seeing them and making eye contact, it's almost like this understanding spiritually where it's like, hey, I see you. You've mm -hmm. been through hell. You came out on the other side. So have I. And it's this level of intense respect without saying nothing, just by energy and, and, and looking each other in the eye. And um, I'm looking forward to that, to be honest with you, because I'm in my detoxing process and it's going to take a little while. It's not going to happen overnight, but at the same time, it will happen. I'm very confident in that, um, that I'll be in a position where I'll be able to recognize another narcissistic uh, abusee survivor person, but also looking forward to my whole different outlook on life, like I'm feeling now where it's like, as bad as this experience was, it's probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life. Do you, sure. do you feel the same way? Oh my gosh, yes. And also because in the environment that I work in, in the healthcare, it, you're surrounded by it, by uh, nurses with huge egos, with doctors with huge egos, and you, you're kind of forced to defend yourself against these kinds of people every single day. So it just, it gives you a level of discernment. And you can tell, you can kind of tell when somebody is giving off that vibe, like, like you said, they've survived it. And I, I would, recently, I would give that off and people respect you a lot more. So do you feel like you have more respect for yourself being a survivor of narcissistic abuse? Definitely, definitely. And I'm proud of the boundaries that I have up so that once you, once you come across that to the level and just, and just constantly with different personalities of narcissism, because I didn't know this from your part one episode, but there's different kinds of narcissists and I've experienced every kind of narcissist not in not just in relationships but in work and mm -hmm. it just gives you like power to yourself that you can identify it very quickly after experiencing it so much you can identify it and put those walls up and boundaries up and you're like this person can never get close to me to the end hurt me to the point that I've experienced before and it's a it's a it's a power to yourself and it's respect for yourself you value your boundaries. You value your your respect, and in some, in you know, people respect you for that. Like, damn, I can't, I can't get one up on, her, or I can't get one up on him. You know. What do you think is the most powerful thing about your character now, based on your experiences dealing with narcissists, 
that you truly feel like confident that it's been, it's at a high level now in regards to your character? Like what's one thing that you took from surviving narcissistic abuse that you now hold near and dear and that you carry with you spiritually and it shows within your personality? What would that one thing be? Pretty sure there's a couple, but what would the one most important thing to you be as far as something that you gain, the wisdom that you gain that you now exhibit and are living, um, or should I say, there's something that's now part of you that they will never leave you. Something that's built the strength in your character now that when somebody meets you and says, Zada, you know, there's something about Zada that this and this and that that's very powerful. Is there one thing that you've gained from surviving narcissistic abuse that um, has helped you tremendously moving forward would, in your life? I would say for me, for the top, and anybody could tell you that meets me, I respect my boundaries. And anybody could tell you that, okay, she, I could tell. You cannot mess with her. She gives off that no bullshit vibes. Don't come to me with that bullshit. And spiritually, I have to put up the boundaries for my energy as well. You're not Mm, only putting up your boundaries for your relationships, for work. You're putting up boundaries from other people's energies. It's, it's to the, at the end of the day, it comes down to spirituality. Once you invite those energies into your life, your spirit is affected heavily. So it's, it's a vibe that, that you cannot come to me with that disrespect, that manipulation, because the discernment comes in very quickly and my boundaries, I will not put down my boundaries for anyone just because I feel like, okay, this person is uh, checking off boxes that I'm looking for in a person and you're just going to put down your boundaries for that person just because they checked off a couple boxes. No, you got to go with your discernment as well, your boundaries. And like you said, you have your boundaries. Now it's, it's on another level. Your, the, the respect you have, you have for your boundaries. And that's where I'm at now. And that's what I've gotten out of it. The most is that no matter who comes in and checks off a couple boxes, I'm still not going to put down my boundaries. It's, it's, it's at a spiritual level. My, my gut has to talk to me and be like, okay, after a while, this person is really, I, I really feel like this person is genuine. And now it's, it's rare to see somebody and feel that from somebody that their intentions in there, everything is pure. You have to be super careful nowadays. So for me, what I got out of it the most was My boundaries, they will always be respected. And I'm always going to go with my spirit. Well, thank you for for sharing all that. I think we we covered a lot in regards to narcissism, what to be aware of, how to know that we're experiencing it, the type of people um, that uh, are prime examples of, of narcissistic people that you could just tell right away. Um, a lot of great things we covered. So we're just hitting the hour. So with that being said, is there any final comments in regards to the topic of discussion, meaning the narcissism series, detoxing from the toxins? Is there any final comments that you want to share and, um, and, and say for the for the listeners? Yes. So one, two things. One is there's a difference between somebody narcissistic and toxic. They could a narcissistic narcissistic person can be toxic, but a toxic person could just be emotionally immature. There may be some things that that we talked about in this episode that your significant other might be displaying, but don't just automatically assume they're, they are a narcissist because they possibly could just be battling whatever they haven't um, dealt with in the past, stuff that they're still healing from, and they could just be join, genu- just a little bit Im- emotionally immature that you two have to work through. 
So just remember that you you could be dealing with a narcissist, but at the same time, you you might not. So just don't automatically assume, you know what I mean? And the second thing is no matter how long you've been with a person, please don't think it's too late to get out of a, out of a relationship or a marriage with a narcissist. It's never too late. Trust me, because uh, my mother, after 20, 30 years of being with uh, the male figure, you know, that was in my life, she got out of it. And she's now, after eight, eight years, she's been with um, her partner now, and she's the happiest she's ever been in her life. So don't think, oh, I'm too old to find love. I'm just going to stick it out with this person. And I'm just going to mm-hmm. continuously just stick it out. And I'm, I'm, I'm too, it's too late. No, 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 no. You're kidding yourself. You're holding yourself back from something beautiful. It's never too late to get out. Wow. That's a very powerful statement, Zada. And I want to thank you for joining this uh, broadcast for the Network of Awareness Narcissism Series, Detoxing from the Toxic. And she made some valid points. You might not be dealing with a narcissist. You, uh, you might just be dealing with a toxic person that has some skeletons in their closet that they haven't cleaned out yet or dealing with some demons that they haven't overcame yet. Um, so I want to thank you again for coming on to the show. Um, definitely will invite you back. Uh, I think you have a lot of great um, insight to contribute to these discussions. So... With that being said, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for tuning in to the second part of the narcissist, or should I say the third part to the narcissism series called Detoxing from the Toxic. So when you live in the present, there's always an opportunity for a new beginning. And don't look for the light at the end of the tunnel because the light is and always will be within you. So light up the tunnel and find your way through the darkness, brothers and sisters. This is Or the Informationalist with Zada from the Caribbean and um, saying peace, love, and light. Baraka Thad, all praise to the Most High, Yahweh Elohim. This concludes the Network of Awareness podcast. For more information on the Network of Awareness, please subscribe via email to our website, networkofawareness.com, and follow us on Spreaker.com or any other listening apps you use. For any questions about the NOA, email us at aura at networkofawareness.com. Thank you for listening to one of the fastest growing podcast shows on society and culture in America and abroad. When you live in the present, there's always an opportunity for a new beginning. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings.